listening to History Man 1781, a project of ekbarns.com, where we walk in the footsteps of heroes and proclaim freedom reigns. On today's podcast, it's actually the second podcast with uh, Mr. Jim Pikich and the Cavalry of the American Revolution. Jim, welcome back. Thank you, Eric. Now, Jim, when we cut off uh, last time in our, in our first uh, of this series, uh, we were at Tarleton and Buford's Massacre, and Tarleton was taking all of these stores that he had gotten from Buford and taking them back to Camden where he was going to meet Cornwallis. And uh, t- take us from there. Where, how did the cavalry uh, coalesce in Camden? Okay, the, uh, the British in Camden uh, are, you know, the British Legion is basically resting as are the, uh, the other British troops. They're also suffering from the Carolina summer heat. Uh, to which they are not accustomed. So the actual battle itself occurred when? The Battle of Camden. No, the, uh, the Buford's Massacre. Buford's Massacre is May 29th. So uh, we're, we're really getting into the hot season in South Carolina at that point. I right. mean, it's starting, the temperatures are starting to get up in the 80s. And uh, come June, they'll be in the 90s. Come July, they may be in the hundreds at that point. How did the British cavalry maintain a unit here in Camden. Well, they, they didn't maintain it as well as Tarleton would have liked. Uh, Tarleton wanted to keep his force compact, ready to strike at the enemy. An insurgency was slowly starting to grow under Francis Marion and Thomas Sumter uh, and other uh, lesser known commanders. And Tarleton liked to keep his unit together. Cornwallis had a tendency, and it's interesting to note that Henry Clinton at the time <clears throat> said that he was always worried of Cornwallis being beaten in detail. He wrote it in French, en détail. What did he mean by that? uh, Cornwallis was a very talented battlefield tactician. In fact, he had studied uh, tactics in in the European continent, correct? Yeah, and he had performed very well under General Howe in the northern campaigns, including in flanking maneuvers. But once in independent command, Cornwallis never undertook a flanking maneuver. His... Tactics were always uh, straightforward frontal assault, and it seemed that, and we see this later, and it's sort of out of our scope at Kings Mountain and Cowpens, with detachments of his army, if a detachment is outside of his immediate field of vision, it's almost as if they cease to exist, and he forgets about them. So Tarleton and Cowpens, I mean, when Tarleton uh, sets out after Morgan on uh, January 15th, two days before the battle, he writes to uh, Cornwallis and says, I, you know, I think you should move up the opposite side of Broad River. And Cornwallis writes him back and says, I'm leaving that. I'm leaving today. You know, I agree with your suggestion and I'll move, move today. And when Cornwallis uh, meets Tarleton after Cowpens, when Tarleton returns to the camp, Cornwallis had not moved oh. since the 15th and had not sent one letter to Tarleton saying he wasn't moving. Oh. Right. And so Tarleton was a little upset because what Cornwallis was doing was using the British Legion cavalry for escort duties to escort foraging groups, supply convoys. So this is in Camden. Uh, yeah, from Camden and sending them all the way uh, to escort convoys toward Charleston uh, to, uh, to carry messages to the posts that are being established farther west at 96 at, uh, in uh, northeastern Georgia at Augusta. And there's a post at Chara at the time, uh, held by the 71st Highlanders, who are Mm -hmm. uh, Scottish and not used to this climate. And about half of their troops are sick and unable to do duty. So there are actually more posts, Hanging Rock, Rocky Mount. And uh, Cornwallis has the cavalry running around everywhere as messengers and errand boys and escorts. And Tarleton's a little upset because he wants to keep the cavalry compact. Uh, he feels that the cavalry's strength is being frittered away. Right. Uh, the energy of the men, that they should be resting, refitting, uh, training the recruits that he had picked up uh, from some of the prisoners uh, he had, who had been captured, uh, some of the loyalists locally who had wanted to join a unit, and Tarleton's unit, except for uh, himself and his second command, were all American loyalists. So. It always struck me that uh, I felt like the British underestimated the expanse of the of the colonies, the expanse of the territory that they were hoping to subdue. Uh, that they were looking at it from their 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 vision of their understanding of Britain or Scotland or Ireland or something like that, and then they get into the the 
uh, backwater areas of uh, the Carolinas, and it just keeps going. Yeah, you know, and uh, and Cornwallis couldn't get out of that. I mean, it, it, he was sending Charlton all over the place. Well, Sherall from horseback, that's a day's ride. Yeah, you know that at the, you know, and that's being very conservative. I mean, uh, you know, it could be more than that depending on how the weather is and the roads. And stuff. Right, so. and as the partisan war intensifies, the partisans are not cavalry, but they generally ride on their own horses and then fight as infantry. So they were able to move more quickly. And that's one of the problems Patrick Ferguson has trying to suppress a counterinsurgency in the northwestern part of the state is that he's trying to pursue mounted men with infantry. And you just can't catch people. In 1781, the British are actually going to realize that they've underestimated their need for cavalry in this theater. They're going to try to mount the South Carolina Royalists. It's going to have mixed success because these men have had years of service as infantry, and they're very good infantry by this time. Right. But uh, to turn them into cavalrymen effectively overnight is not going to be easy. They're also going to take a Loyalist regiment called the New York Volunteers and mount part of their infantry uh, to try to get more cavalry. And Nisbet Balfour, the lieutenant colonel who commands the Charleston garrison, is going to write back to his superiors in London and say, for want of cavalry, we are in serious distress. And you now the British are still going to sit on those 20 plus regiments of trained regular cavalry in Britain. And you know, two or three sent here would have done right. for excellent service for what they were trying to do. So where did Charlton put his horses up around Camden? We're not sure. Um, probably dispersed throughout the town for forage. Um, well, I know that he sent. Area at the time didn't he send uh, Captain Huck? Wasn't he one of Tarleton's main guys? Yeah, Huck was one of Tarleton's company commanders, troop commanders. And he sent him up to up to Rocky Mount, right? Right after they took Camden. Yeah, with some of the loyal militia, where they were ambushed in one of these early partisan attacks. Right, but he had a how much of a he was part of the legion, right? He was right. part of Tarleton's group, a cavalry. Cavalry yeah. splinter off of Tarleton's group. Right. How many did he take with him? Do you remember? He would have taken his troop, which would have been about forty men. Okay, and all of them, all of them are mounted, and he's having to deal with the feed and that sort of thing. Yeah, is he living off the land? They throw him out to pasture. What, what are they doing yeah, with they, the horses? They, uh, when they're traveling, they usually live off the land. They forage the horses if they can't find any forage officially, and and Cornwallis tries to do this. Uh, Tarleton actually tries to do it, all the British officers, especially in the early part of the occupation, they try to, if they don't have money to pay, they at least issue certificates. I see. So if, if they're taking a horse on the march to replace one that's worn out, if they're taking five bales of hay, if they're taking oats, uh, they will write, you know, receive from and, you know, the quantity and the type of goods, uh, and you can... Uh, take that certificate and signed by the British officer and then bring it technically to one of the British garrisons and be reimbursed. Were they reimbursed? Some of them were. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, so actually the cavalry was involved in this. Henry Lee's Legion uh, was involved with trying to intercept British parties that were uh, collecting food for the British in Philadelphia during the Valley Forge winter of 1777 uh -huh. and 1778. And the reason... They were out there, and this was a delicate situation for Washington. He didn't want Lee to intercept the farmers, which would have been the easy task. Lee had to intercept the British after they purchased the goods. But the reason the Americans were starving at Valley Forge was not because of a food shortage in Pennsylvania. It's because the Pennsylvania farmers would ride by Washington's camp and see the sentries and cheer, hurrah for liberty, with their wagons full of food to sell to the British detachments that General Howe had sent out because Howe was paying gold and silver for the goods, for meat. Treasonous. <laughs> really, in a sense, it was. Lee wanted to go after the farmers, but Washington said, no, we can't lose their support. You know, we just, you just try to get them How fascinating. back to the that, British. That is interesting. And Lee did interdict a good amount of that with his Legion cavalry. Uh, but yeah, Washington had nothing to offer except these certificates or continental paper money, which was next to worthless. So the when farmers the, had to make a living, they felt, and... The in British, the, how could in the, the back British country of South Carolina with uh, other than the indigo and the rice and stuff? I, 
you didn't have very many farmers like that, did you? I mean, it didn't. No, I mean you had a, basically a subsistence farming economy, yeah. so the people didn't have a whole lot to spare. That's right. So, That's which right. of course, uh, and then as the partisan warfare intensifies, of course, then the British start taking items from people, even though they're not authorized to do so. Lower ranking officers will just say, "Hey, these people are rebels. You know, we need so much forage, or we need, you know, so much c corn, whatever item they want." We're just taking it because we consider this person a rebel. So that's their penalty for not returning to their allegiance. When did the American cavalry come in? Well, the American cavalry first made a reappearance. After Carleton cut up Washington and White's units, they were ordered to go to North Carolina to refit with the survivors. Okay. White did not return. Uh, the two units were combined under William Washington, who was a cousin of George Washington, and they returned late in 1780. In the meantime, the only unit that was left was Armand's Legion, a mixed unit of uh, cavalry and light infantry, which consisted of the remnants of Pulaski's troops, uh, who had survived uh, the battle at Savannah, Georgia in 1779, plus uh, Lausanne's Legion, uh, which was the first legion uh, was recruited and trained by a French volunteer who had originally arrived at Boston. And so they amalgamated those units under Armand, and they were not in the field or active for very long. They took part in the Camden campaign when Horatio Gates took over command of the army in the South, the Southern Continental Army, and decided to move and threaten the British in Camden. He had Armand's legion, as was customary, cavalry leads the march. Uh, Cornwallis had decided that same day that he was going to march, and the two armies marched at the same time. Gates intending to take a position uh, behind one of the creeks north of town where he can threaten Camden and hope he could get Cornwallis to do what he had gotten Burgoyne to do at Saratoga, attack him on highly unfavorable ground where he has a numerical advantage. He can then defeat the British Army and force them either to withdraw from the Carolina interior or uh, perhaps catch them on their retreat and uh, defeat them and force them to surrender. So uh, on the march, you have Armand at the front of his march. Yeah. They're not marching to attack Camden. They're marching to reposition their army on right. favorable ground. Yeah. And then they meet, they meet uh, uh, Cornwallis, who's doing the same thing. He's yeah. coming out to meet them on favorable ground, and they, they meet at 2 o'clock in the morning or, or yeah. whatever. Yeah, Cornwallis right? has decided that he thinks Gates is going to sit in his camp at Rugeley's Mill, so Cornwallis decides he's going to make a night march and attack the Americans in, at dawn in their camp, take them by surprise and destroy their army. Both armies march at the same time, 10 p.m. The British, who are just better trained troops and less exhausted at this point and better fed, pass the point that Gates had been aiming to reach before Gates can get there. Right. So uh, they encounter Armand's legion with light infantry and in support on the flanks in the fields on the main road north. At about 2 a.m., Tarleton's cavalry is also in the road leading. That's a sta standard tactics march order. Uh, Tarleton, of course, immediately sees troops ahead and orders an attack. Armand's men flee. They dissipate. They dissipate, yeah, very quickly. Uh, but the light infantry, militia light infantry in the surrounding fields uh, begins firing on the British cavalry. They then pull back and bring up their light infantry. On the next day... The battle is fought. Gates, having lost confidence in Armand, not surprisingly, uh, puts his legion in the rear and on the left flank to bolster the militia. But when the militia flee at the uh, beginning of the battle on the American left, Armand's men also flee. Uh, they do give them credit. They don't flee completely. They stop and loot their own army's wagon train. <laughs> and that's the last pretty much we hear of Armand's legion. Uh, Tarleton's legion cavalry plays a key role. The British are unable on either the right or the left to defeat the Americans, but the Americans are not able, they're, they can hold their ground, but they can't push the British back. And so it's, the battle's gridlocked for 45 minutes or so. Tarleton's last reserve is the British Legion, uh, Cardinal's last reserve is the British Legion cavalry. And he's got them in the road, and he notices there is a gap of about 150 yards between the American right wing and their left wing. And so he sends Tarleton charging through the gap. 
Tarleton splits his men into two, one uh, part going behind the American left wing, the other part going behind the American right wing. This dislocates their whole position. They flee, and Tarleton chases them 22 miles north of the battlefield, capturing the wagon train, the reserve artillery, uh, a large number of prisoners, uh, before he calls a halt to the pursuit and then comes back. So uh, we see cavalry having a major role in this battle. Uh, again, the British cavalry having the advantage. So literally, that's the end of any American cavalry in, in, the, in the South Carolina campaign, the Southern campaign at that point, right? Right. So uh, Tarleton goes back to Camden. They all go back to Camden. They're saying, okay, we're now pushing up into North Carolina. Uh, but then they get hit with disease. Yeah, Tarleton is felled. He is sick. Uh, his second in command, George Hanger, takes over the British Legion, but he doesn't have whatever command mystique certain officers have. Someone that might he's a manager, not a leader. Yeah, you, you know, George Patton. Think of you know. I, I was just reading something recently where you know everybody in the Third Army called him names behind his back, but everybody you know would have you know died for him. Yeah, there were just some whether officers. they wanted to or not, That's they would right. have died for it. <laughs> but there are some officers who inspire and bring out the best of their troops, and there are others uh, right. who don't do that. So, uh, yeah, so Tarleton is laid low, and the British Legion uh, doesn't really get into action uh, significantly until uh, later in the fall when he is Tarleton is sent in pursuit of Marion. He doesn't, isn't able to catch up with Marion. He still wants to do it, but then Cornwallis orders him back uh, to pursue Sumter. Now, two days after the Battle of Camden, Tarleton had been sent after Sumter in Fishing Creek. He caught Sumter literally napping under a wagon right. and uh, really devastated Sumter's command, uh, freed a lot of prisoners that Sumter had taken, captured a lot of equipment that Sumter had taken from the British. So uh, Sumter had been out of action for a while after that, re recruiting. And Tarleton goes after Sumter. Uh, Cornwallis has mounted uh, part of an infantry regiment to make up for the shortage of cavalry he's beginning to recognize they need. Uh, but again, these aren't trained cavalrymen. They get into an action at Blackstock's without orders. Tarleton ends up having to charge to extricate them from the American militia. And so he is repulsed. Sumter is wounded. But the British Legion is sort of losing its aura of invincibility. Is that the first time Tarleton loses at Blackstock, or did he lose a battle down in Charleston before? No, that's, that's really the first time he loses. Okay. So. All right. so tell me about the American cavalry. So Sumter, Sumter and, and, and Tarleton get into it at Blackstock's, but still we have no American cavalry coming in yet. No, they, they, they come back late in 1780. I see. And William Washington comes back with his reconstituted regiment of light dragoons, Continentals. Okay. And their first action is actually near here at Rugeley's Mill, the site of uh, Gates' camp. Lord Rodden is Cornwallis' second in command. Uh, Cornwallis has, has begun his operations against Daniel Morgan in the Northwest. And Washington is actually collaborating with Morgan, but he swings down to threaten Camden. Uh, Henry Rugeley, uh, the loyalist militia colonel. He kind of went back and forth, didn't he? Yeah. It's uh, just like whoever showed up in his yard, okay, y'all do whatever you need to do. You know, that sort of thing. That's right. Uh, Rodden, Rodden wrote in several of his letters that he was, wasn't sure if Rugeley was a committed loyalist or, or was a spy well, he's kin to everybody, right? I mean, yeah. he, he, was, he was still kin to people all around here on both yeah. sides. It was still a civil war, whether the British wanted to look at it that way or not. So. That's right. And I saw his loyalist claim. Everybody in the area owed him money. <laughs> so, right. And, and incidentally, because he didn't leave uh, with the other loyalists, the most committed loyalists, when Charleston was evacuated in 1782, he actually was still living in South Carolina, but had the nerve to file a claim with the uh, British government for his losses. <laughs> and, uh, needless to say, it wasn't paid. <laughs> so, uh, but uh, Rodden ordered Rugeley to come back. He, Rugeley had about 130 militia men with him. And Rodden said, come into the fortifications of Camden. Rugeley said, no, I can defend my fortified barn. William Washington shows up and sends it a surrender demand. And this is where, because of Rugeley's uh, 
constant shifts of opinion. Washington made a Quaker gun, as they called it. He took a couple of wagon wheels and an axle, and he mounted a log on it. And in the twilight, he rolled it out and he said, if you don't surrender, I'm going to come out. And Rusley, of course, surrendered his whole command to Washington. Now, whether Rusley actually thought it was an artillery piece or whether he disobeyed orders strictly looking to ingratiate himself with the Americans who seemed to be on the rebound and wanted to surrender, uh, he, he nevertheless surrendered to Washington, who then... Um, what, what was his main profession? Was he just a merchant man or yeah, plant, he was a merchant, planter, a planter. Or what? He was he was into everything. He was into so, everything. Yeah. So he was just trying to find make a buck. It sounds like yeah. <laughs> All right. So uh, William Washington's back into the state. So walk me through seventeen. Uh, this is seventeen eighty one. Is that right? Yeah. So yeah, the, walk, the surrender of Rugeley's is uh, late December of seventeen. 1780, okay. Yeah, and, and this is before, this is after Kings Mountain. After Kings Mountain. Before Cowpens. Right. Uh, and obviously before Yorktown after that, Guilford's Courthouse after that. So, right. Or Guilford's Courthouse, then then Yorktown. So Washington is up at Rugeley's Mills, December 1780. Uh, is he the only Continental Cavalry unit? Uh, by now, Lee's Legion has been... Uh, oh. which has been sent south to reinforce Nathaniel Green, who's replaced Gates. And they're and, all light, uh, light cavalry. He has light infantry and cavalry. I see. And light dragoons also. I see. And Green has sent Lee to cooperate with Marion. Uh, in January of 1781, they're going to attack Georgetown, and they're going to get into the town, but they're not going to be able to dislodge the garrison from its fortifications. And then Lee is going to be recalled after Cowpens when the American army starts uh, withdrawing across North Carolina. And of course, Washington from Rugeley's goes to join Morgan at Cowpens with his cavalry. Do we have any um, quartermaster receipts or anything that Lee and uh, Washington, uh, William Washington, uh, you know, requested for sabers or, or other accoutrements for their horses and stuff? None that I've seen. When Lee's cavalry came down, they were splendidly equipped. Is that right? Uh, the, Lee was a stickler for his men being properly uniformed and properly equipped in the state of Virginia, being the, one of the wealthiest uh, of the states, and also with the Lee family's influence, including two relatives in the Continental Congress. Lee was pretty much able to make sure his men were okay. Uh, Washington did get into trouble after, uh, before Guilford Courthouse, after uh, the withdrawal uh, into Virginia, the race to the Dan, uh, because he was impressing horses in Virginia to rebuild his unit, and he was taking apparently very valuable stud horses from the Virginia planters and using them as cavalry mounts and issuing certificates at a fraction of their value in these uh, owners' complaint to Nathaniel Green. And Green told Washington to stop it. Wow, wow. So, so there's a cavalry action that I, I'd like to talk about. I don't know if you have uh, some background in it. Do you know anything about Pyle's Defeat? Pyle's Defeat, yeah. the uh, Pyle's Defeat or Pyle's Massacre. So we have Buford's yep. Massacre. Yep, now we have. Now we have Pyle's Massacre. Yeah. And this was in North Carolina, correct? Right. Uh, just to quickly summarize what happens, there's a battle at Cowpens where Tarleton is defeated. William Washington distinguishes himself with his cavalry. Tarleton has kept his cavalry in reserve. The British Legion cavalry has now been recruited up to 400. It's a very large unit, strong enough to save the day. Tarleton knows that. He orders them to charge, and he goes with his officers forward at William Washington. As he gets into a saber duel, uh, Tarleton and his officers with Washington and his officers. And at some point, Tarleton looks back, and his 400 Cavalry have not followed him in and reversed the tide. They have turned and run for Cornwallis's camp, which forces Tarleton to break off the action with Washington. So um, at that point, Cornwallis decides he's going to pursue Morgan and release all the prisoners he lost at Cowpens, but he takes two days to burn his baggage. I don't know why he just didn't assign one regiment to burn the baggage to take the rest of the army off after Morgan and save two days, but Cornwallis uh, sometimes... Well, thank goodness, thank goodness he did. Yes, Because it was the race to the River Dan, right? Yeah, it was the race to the Dan. Washington's cavalry and Lee's cavalry form part of the rear guard, and they are engaged in frequent skirmishing with Tarleton's cavalry. Uh, Tarleton's cavalry 
cuts up the North Carolina pretty badly after crossing the Catawba River. Um, but again, Tarleton's losing some of his invinci- ideas of invincibility because he is up against now well-trained veteran, uh, fairly well-equipped in the case of Lee's Legion, splendidly equipped units. So, um, and by this point, it really was the American cavalry was par in par with the British cavalry at that point. Yeah, and Lee pointed out that by the time of the race to the Dan, you know, he had his men had excellent horses that they had procured in Virginia on the way south. And he described Tarleton's horses as marsh tackies, these small pony-like horses, uh, because those first-rate horses uh, that they had acquired when they first reached South Carolina by now have been worn out. So they were engagements all the way on the race to the Dan Green, of course, to lose Cornwallis and gets to safety in Virginia. After a short time, Lee is anxious to get back into action. And so uh, Andrew Pickens and his South Carolina militia are with Lee and their term of service is expiring. So they want to go home. They hadn't counted on uh, going all the way up to Virginia. <laughs> so Green decides Lee is a, the type of person, sort of like Anthony Wayne, you have to keep him active or you know, he'll start coming up with bizarre plans and uh, p- taking his own initiative and things not turning out maybe too well. So uh, Green says, OK, Lee, take your legion and go back into North Carolina, find out where Cornwallis is and you know, keep an eye on him, Get, send me some reports. Pickens accompanies Lee because he's planning on taking his militia back to South Carolina. They are still together when they encounter a few, a couple of officers riding ahead of 400 North Carolina mounted loyalists commanded by Colonel John Pyle. He has got a commission to raise troops uh, to reinforce Cornwallis's army, and they are on the way to unite with Tarleton. Tarleton is out looking for them. Tarleton complained later. He said the problem with Pyle, he said he, he would have been fine if they had come quickly, but they kept stopping at the houses of their friends and go in and have something to drink and say hello to somebody else. Uh, I mean, these weren't trained troops. They were raw militia. They had, of course, not served with the American militia who had been the only ones in North Carolina to see extensive service except for the uh, Loyalist Regiment of Refugees. So uh, so these men are untrained. They meet Lee and his uh, officers and... Lee's men are wearing green jackets to signify that's a signification of elite status. The Hessian Jaegers, uh, who are elite light infantry, Lee's Legion and Tarleton's Legion, uh, the Queen's Rangers, wear green jackets as a designation of union uh, of elite status rather than, you know, than camouflage, let's say. Uh, because certainly nothing else they wear is camouflage. But... Uh, it designates their status, so they see these green uniform troops, and they assume that these are Tarleton's officers. So they make a report. That it's actually Lee's officers. So Lee realizes that you know he has a chance to take them. He claimed in his memoirs that he wanted to. Paul was at the rear of the column, and he wanted to get alongside them. And then when he reached Pyle, demand Pyle surrender, and that was all. He said, it, you know, he he didn't want any bloodshed if it could have been avoided. Some of the soldiers who were there recorded later in their pension applications that they had been told you know, to wait for a signal and then to attack the Loyalists. So there, there's some controversy over that. It's sort of the American version of the wax highs. Uh, but in any case, at some point, for whatever the reason, whether Lee says whatever word people are waiting for or whether it's as some people said that some of Pyle's men saw Pickens' militia and realized they were rebels, at some point, recognition dawns. Lee's men, who are prepared, immediately pitch it to Pyle's men who have no sabers, who have rifles slung over their shoulders or muskets slung over their shoulders, and they just uh, begin cutting them up, uh, killing about 90 uh, wounding many more, and uh, the survivors flee. Uh, A few of them reach Tarleton, but uh, Pyle's force is destroyed by Lee and Pickens, and they're all very happy, as is Green, because this is a center of North Carolina loyalism, and after these people see what happened to Pyle, Cornwallis says, nobody wants to come and join my army. Well, your army's been marching through winter storms, and they're starving, their clothes are worn out, they're barefoot, and now the men who did come to join your army have been slaughtered. Lee's and Pickens' men suffered one casualty. Uh, a man broke his leg when his horse was injured and fell on him. Uh, 
that was it. So it was very even one-sided, more one-sided, wasn't it? Yeah, even more so than the wax size. But that was crucial for Green uh, and for Cornwallis. Uh, Green for not having to worry about loyalists turning out to support Cornwallis after this defeat. Sure. Uh, Cornwallis not getting this 400 men added to his strength, say, at Guilford Courthouse, could have you know made the difference between driving Green from the field and actually sure. destroying Green's army. And sure. Capturing him. Thank you for that. That that is a, a fantastic broad sweep of cavalry in the in the Southern campaign there, and uh, I appreciate you just sharing with us today. And if our listeners out there are interested, it's cavalry of the uh, of the Revolution. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah cavalry of the American Revolution. Of the American Revolution. And uh, is that an Am- could they get it on Amazon? Yeah, you can get it on Amazon. You can get it from the publisher West Home through their website or catalog. It's in paperback. It's an ebook. Uh, so it's available in a variety of ways. Well, thank you so much. Appreciate you. You're welcome. All right.